going on, man? How are you? I'm good. Uh, I think your camera is off. Unless you want it off. No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Totally How are forgot. you? How are you, man? Thank you for coming on, and uh, I'm hoping everything is well. How are things? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, thank you for having me on, most importantly. I appreciate it, and I look forward to it, man. Let's have some fun. Let's rock. Man, you have a phenomenal mic. We got to get you on as a co-host, <laughs> man. You're ready to rock and roll. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I was telling my audience, obviously, you have many years uh, where you were um, as a matchmaker for Golden Boy, uh, have you transitioned into an advisor at this point? Because I feel like I see you um, in many different fights, but uh, you know I don't have an official role. I but 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 from what I can see, I get the impression you may be advising at this point. So, yes, uh, after fifth, I mean I was with Golden Boy fifteen years. And after that, you know, obviously every change, every transition is a little difficult. And it was first, the first couple of months was like, great. It's a vacation now. I'm, I'm, I'm like, for the first time in 15 years, as a matchmaker, it's very stressful. You know, uh, losing fights because the guy missed his plane, losing fights because the guy came in 10 pounds over, losing fights because he didn't pass a medical. It always happens the day before or two days before the fight when there's hurry up and try to fix it because the hardest thing for me as a matchmaker was always going to a fighter and his team saying, you're not fighting because I couldn't get a replacement or I couldn't get an opponent. That's very hard. When you know the other side and know what they go through, sacrifices, cutting weight, selling tickets, excited that they're going to fight and then break their heart and tell them you're not fighting. And it happens, but you try to avoid it as much as possible. So knowing that I didn't have to stress about that was like a relief now that it was like, okay, let's enjoy some vacation. We haven't had a good long vacation for a while. Two, three months passed. What do you do with the free time? That's what happened to the fighters. You know, they fight, they fight. And when retirement comes, it's like, what do I do now with all this free time? They go back to the gym, they train, they might as well fight if they're in there so much. So it started, okay, I'm tired of being at home. I'm tired of vacation. I want to get back to work. But I was very fortunate to be getting calls from a lot of fighters that I worked with in the past. And once the word got out little by little that, hey, you're not at Golden Boy anymore, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. And as long as I knew they weren't in danger, because there is a little bond, there is that connection you have, especially with some of these guys that started calling me, all right, let's go. Show me show me in the gym first, and let's go. And little by little, the word started traveling. I had champions calling me saying, can you help me? Can you help me? Can you help? And it was like, fuck, let's go. So I adapted into this new role. I joined, uh, I partnered up with a couple managers that handle fighters, sheer sports management based out here in LA. Uh, partnered up with them as well. So I advise and manage and help run that company. But I'm also getting calls from Jorge Linares called me last year. Hey, are you the man? I don't want to go out this way. I lost two fights in Russia. Can you help me? Jorge, it's over, papi. That's done. It's, you know, it time, father time. Let's transition to something else. In fact, start training fighters. Bring me opponents. Bring me fighters. We'll build champions together. I'd love to see you still in boxing, but no, I'll show you. And he started training, and I started seeing his videos. And he turned, I was in L.A. He was in Miami. But I started seeing that old Jorge back in the gym, the fire, the hunger. The... So let's go. Made the fight with Matchroom and against Jack Catterall. Yeah, he showed all indications and led me to believe that he was going to win that fight. I had very confident. I said, Eddie, start getting the date for the rematch. We are going to beat Catterall. It's, it, it's, it's a done deal. Just get me the date for the rematch. We had a rematch clause. Once the fight started, I saw Jorge's speed. He still had it, but what he didn't have, what was once so easy for him, is letting his hands go. And I, I had promised all involved that, hey, I see him hurt, I'm stopping the fight. And I told him, I'm stopping the fight if I see you hurt. You're not here to get hurt. He finished on his feet. He finished with his head up, and it was like, okay, pero yeah. And he said, yes, now I can close the book. Now let's go on to the new chapter. So I was proud of that. We started very early on together, finished together. Pablo Cesar Cano 
calls me, same thing, get him a win on Pro Box, knocks out Zachary Ochoa, gets a world title eliminator, wasn't a pretty fight, didn't get up, beat up, got paid, ahora sí, hijo, retire. I, I saw the same thing. You, you're a big puncher, but what good is it if you go and you only throw one punch at a time? You can't let your hands go anymore. That's father time. So, but I'm very proud because they're reaching out to me, the trust, the bond, the confidence. There was fights last year that it was like, hey, how much? No, not the way I, I can't charge you. There's not enough money there. A female fight. We had an interim world title fight in Mexico, Yvette Zamora. Oye, Roberto, how much do I got to pay you? Honey, your purse is $10,000. What am I going to get? 1000 No. You know what you're going to pay me? Go win that world title. Come back as a world champion. We went together, but bring that title back. Let's win that title, and then we'll go make real money. So it's been a transition. But that's what I love more in the matchmaking, working directly with the fighter anyway. That's what was always my energy and my my adrenaline was working with fighters. So now today, working directly with fighters. I mean, Jason Quigley last year, we went to Ireland. We got a win. It was going to be the retirement. You know, he was going to fight as a pro for the first time. But it was going to be his farewell to his where he started as an amateur. And he wins and we get the call. Hey, will he fight Berlanga? And I'm like, ah, this was a one fight thing. Hey, Jason, they want you to fight Berlanga. Let's go. I'm like, oh, come on. That's the problem when going and getting a win. They want another one, another one, another. But I was happy. I was satisfied. He got paid. And he put on a performance that showed his heart. He showed the true quickly, and, and it was a good fight. He went up and said, okay, I fought one of the top guys in boxing today. I came up short, but I showed my heart. I showed my skill. And ahora sí. Now he's still telling me, hey, uh, one more, one more. I'm like, no, Jay, let's go. Start promoting. He did a couple shows last year and uh, as a promoter, as a manager, and he's doing really good. So I love seeing that other chapter in them. Jorge Linares supervising for the WBA now, training fighters in Florida. So you, I love seeing that that good story. At least for now, it's it's a good story. They're still involved in the sport they love without fighting past and getting hurt or without being – this place, you know, all broke or something on the street or on drugs and alcohol, or, you know, depressed because that's what it is. Roberto, how'd you get your start? Like, who mentored you? Who taught you the art of matchmaking? You know, a lot of fight fans, we sit here and we want this fight versus that fighter, but it's a lot more intricate than that and, and, and more difficult to put together a fight than just wanting two good fighters to get in the ring. Uh, who'd you come up under? Who taught you the game? To be honest, nobody did. Um, nobody. Uh, I say that humbly. Um, I love boxing from an early age because my dad, who was a fan, not didn't work boxing, didn't, uh, but he was a fan. Take me to the fights. Would have the big fights at the house whenever before there was pay per view. All the big fights on national TV. Salvador Sanchez, Muhammad Ali. That's to this day still my idol, Muhammad Ali. Um, I associated big fight boxing with parties because every time there was a big fight there was family friends cousins everybody at the house food drinks everything even as a little kid and as i grew and started falling in love with boxing and, and understanding in it i fell into i was never going to think about i mean it's a dream come true that i'm that i ended up working not only in boxing but with one of the top promoters in the world and worked with so many athletes, but that was, I couldn't have even dreamt that if you would have asked me. Um, I fell into it because I met one of my idols at a mall during a Christmas season before there were cell phones with, with, with cameras. And I see him and I'm like, holy crap, there's my Marco Antonio Barrera. Wow. He had just lost to Junior Jones. So I approached him. Keep your head up. I'm a big fan. You'll be back, blah, blah, blah. And I go around the mall trying to find for something for him to sign. But I was always very particular. If you're a baseball player, it has to be a baseball bat, a glove, football player, something football. Related. So it was boxing. Let me find a glove, a headgear, a mouthpiece, something boxing related. And there wasn't this. This was in San Diego. Uh, one of the malls, stores, clothing, all that. So... I come back out and I said, Marco, if I give you my address, um, I bump into him again. I probably He probably thought I was like a stalker. Here's this guy again. And, and I said, if I give you my address, will you send me something autographed? Again, I'm a big fan. 
I have all your fights on VHS. And, and he said, yeah, give it to me. So I give it to him. A couple weeks later in the mail, photo, studio, T-shirt, hey, stay in touch. Now, fast forward a couple, a year and a half later, he's going to fight in a December on a Fantasy Springs show. Before they had the arena, it was outdoors and small event. And he's going to do a like a tune-up exhibition type fight right before the first Morales fight. And I lived in Chula Vista, which is 15 minutes away from Tijuana. I loved Morales. I loved Barrera. And when they were going to fight, I said, fuck, this is hard. Again, I'm a fan. I'm, I'm not connected to boxing. I'm a fan. And I'm like, I'm going to have to go with Barrera. So I go to that exhibition. And as he's walking in, I'm outside. Waiting for, you know, the fight. Where's the fighter? And oh, they check into this table. He walks in, and this was the craziest thing. I and got to know him and built a relationship with him. Marco had an amazing memory. And when he saw me, he said, San Diego, huh? And I'm like, yeah. He didn't remember Roberto Diaz from all the fans and everybody he meets on a daily. But he said, San Diego. Yeah. We met at the mall. Yeah. Come in the back with me. And he brings me into the dressing room introduces me to the team. We connect. He ends up doing his first camp in Big Bear for the Morales fight. Now, remember, this was like right, around, right before Christmas. The first Morales fight was February 19. So after that exhibition, boom, he goes straight to Mexico, goes straight to Big Bear and starts training. We become close. We become friends. He brings me on. Hey, bring the flag in, translate here. There. Just as a friend, just as a, a groupie, a fan. From there, he's going to leave his promoter and management and then calls me and says, hey, I'm leaving them. Um, will you come with me or are you going to stay with them? I had built a relationship with the management because of him. And I said, no, I'm with you. And that's when he signs the biggest name, the first big name, signs with Golden Boy. And we go there and he says, hey, uh, we'll start talking to Richard, start talking to Golden Boy people and, and about my fight. He had already had a fight signed and done when I come with him. He had already signed a contract with Golden Boy, the first Pacquiao fight. So obviously that fight didn't go well. Marco loses. I'm thinking, man, there's it. I started and I finished all in one fight. And Golden Boy gave him another chance. The career continued. And I became like an advisor to Marco. I started... I would turn down fights. Oh, what about this guy? What about that guy? No, I don't like his style. Don't like... Every fan is a great matchmaker. You know, you said it earlier when fans, why don't they make this fight? That Fans are the best matchmakers. They know styles make fights. They know what fights are good, going to hit and what fights aren't. What they don't know is what we go through as matchmakers is, okay, A should fight B. Okay, that's the simple part. Oh, this is a no-brainer. This is going to happen. A's wife says no. B's husband says no. The manager, the trainer, there's too much obstacles. Just It's not as easy as, you know what? I woke up last night. I had a dream that this is a can't hit, a can't miss. This is the fight to make. Yeah. Tell that to the trainer. Tell that to the manager. Tell that to the husband. Tell that to the wife, to the father, the mother. There's so many obstacles before you can make that fight. Because there's egos, because there's we can build this fight in five years. It'll it'll really be big. Well, you don't know that. What if you lose? What if he loses? So you try to make both sides happy to see the potential of the winner moving on to bigger and better things. You know, it's very very when the matchmaker gets one of those fighters, managers, trainers that it's so easy to matchmake. And everything's like, no problem. We'll take it. We'll take it. We'll take it. It's like, wow, this is too I easy. Hear, is it, 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 don't you have a story about Danny Garcia that way? Yeah. Danny Garcia, you know, I don't work with him anymore. It's been many years that, but you got to, hey, what is blue is blue. Danny Garcia never turned down a fight. Angel never turned down the fight. He was so great to match make with. And it's true. You know, a lot of opponents, oh, yeah, we'll fight Danny Garcia. We could beat Danny Garcia. You looked at him and said, yeah, there's there's not too much to it. Danny Garcia had a will to win. He would find a way to win. And, I mean, obviously early on he was blowing guys out. But once he got to that top level, 
Lucas Matisse. He, he would always find a way. I'll tell you, Mauricio Herrera came into my office and said they wanted to sign with Golden Boy. The, the, the trainer manager at the time says, give us a couple of tune-ups. I said, bro, if you want tune-ups, go back to where you came from. They, that's where you were. You came here for big fights. I can get you the Danny Garcia fight. And Mauricio said, just pull out the contract. I'll sign. And I said, okay, I'm going to beat Danny Garcia, though. And I said, yeah, no problem. Hey, that's, you know, I, I just want a good fight. Even if you don't beat him, as long as you give me a good fight, you know, give it your all. I'm going to beat Danny Garcia. I, I'm like, all right, you know, you got six weeks. And Danny Garcia at the time was unbeatable. I watched the fight and I was like, wow, Pinchi Mauricio, you know, those are the kind of fighters that you love to work with. The ones that I believe in myself and I'm not, I'll take the short end because once I beat him, they, they, they still that throwback type fighter. I know that to, to make money, I got to beat this guy and then the money's going to come. But you get in an era, there was an era where now nah, if the money's not right, then I'd rather wait five years. And that's the obstacles that you have to, overcome you have to even opponents you have to sell a dream an opportunity look you beat this guy you can get a contract look we'll bring you back even if you don't but you give a good fight come give me your best effort so the fans walk away happy and and that's what you're constantly doing and dealing with uh when you departed from golden boy did you ever think let me just keep matchmaking like obviously you know, throughout the boxing industry, uh, top rank gets a lot of credit, right? They love to call their matchmakers the best in the business. Did that not cross your mind? Or Matchroom is relatively new and certainly can use some help uh, with experienced matchmaking to cater to the U.S. Uh, did you not want to be in that field anymore? And that's why you didn't reach out to some of these? Because uh, Ben Shalom and, and Boxer... They, they don't have someone as experienced as yourself. So just asking. No, no, no. Thank you. Um, I got a lot of calls. I got a few. Well, I got a few calls. And from small promoters to big promoters. And at the, at the beginning, it's especially when it first came out and it was known, that's when the calls came in right away. I, I told them, thank you. I appreciate it. But I need some time to think of what I want to do. I, I didn't know what I wanted to do at that point. It was still like, okay, where am I going to go next? You know, what what am I going to do? I, I haven't been somebody that goes from one place to another. I was with Barrera for almost 10 years and with Golden Boy 15 years. So those were my two boxing periods, the last 25 years with two. After a few months of thinking it over, I said, you know what? If I go in, I didn't want to batch make anymore. To answer the question, I didn't want to matchmake anymore. I thought to myself, once a matchmaker, you always be a matchmaker. You always think whether you're a managing side, they offer an opponent. No, no, no. Uh, no, I don't want this type of match. It's not good for us. It doesn't benefit us. It, it's not going anywhere. Or yes, perfect. This is it. So you're always going to have that matchmaker mentality. But I said, I want to work smarter, not harder. And if I was going to go into a position of matchmaking, it had to be, and, and I say this humbly, I didn't want to go uh, to a small promoter and be like like the, the story of the fighter who was a world champion at one point, and now he's fighting in the, in the ballrooms. And I didn't want to go backwards. And I said, it's either going to have to be with one of the top promoters. And what happens if I go to one of the top promoters? I'm going to be every weekend on the road, every weekend with the stress of the fight. And I had done that. Remember when Golden Boy had the HBO dates and had all the world champions, the Danny Garcia, Adrian Broner, the Charles, Mares, Leo Santa Cruz, Deontay Wilder, Jacobs. We were so busy because it wasn't HBO only. We had Televisa in Mexico at the same time. We had Fox. We had ES. There was all kinds of shows going on. There was times where one month we had six shows, six different events. So it was like... Imagine making all these fights. Something's going to fall out. So, so towards the end, it was a lot slower. Once a month a show, maybe two months. I started getting to that point. Even though it's still a lot, it, people don't understand. One show a month is a lot because you're finished with a show and you got three weeks to go. And you've already been promoting. You've already been matching. You've already. 
But next thing you know, it's on top of you. So you better get those matches done. Otherwise, you're going to break hearts of saying you're not fighting. You're not fighting. You fell out. Your opponent, we couldn't get one. And it's happening. You see it. So I'm like, do I want to go there again? At least not now. And then I thought, if I do, I'd rather do it with a startup company. Brand new. Let's start from scratch. But guess what? This time, again, experience. Like anything else, you learn from your past. I'm going to be an owner. Because I'm not going to go work and build champions and, and then walk away with, with not a piece of it. So at that point, it's like, if I'm going to build something from scratch, I'd rather do something from scratch. And if it succeeds and hits the sky and everything, I'm an owner. I'm a part of this. And not just tomorrow. Well, thank you very much. I nos vemos. But I'm, I'm actually, I love the role right now of managing, of advising these fighters. Uh, I go to fights when I can. I don't go to fights when I can. I, I had a fight with Matchroom in Monaco last year. One of the kids went out. I said, I can't make it. I have another commitment. Okay, here's your payment. Uh, you know, I go to, I went to Uzbekistan for the convention. I mean, I'm picking and choosing where I go, but it's now more of, I'm there for a purpose, for a job. I went to Ireland twice with Quigley, but I make sure everything's handled. Everything's in the proper state. The weigh-ins, everything's good. My fighter ate everything. Go rest, get off the phone, stop with the social. Let's go in there and win. Regardless of the end, but it's almost like a vacation because I don't have the whole show on top of me where before it was the whole show. And I'm sure you was on call, you know, from Golden Boy. So, you know, if they needed you to do other things, you probably were available for that. Yeah, the phone's never off. When you're a matchmaker, the phone's never off. So uh, being a matchmaker, you had firsthand dealings with Jojo Diaz. Uh, Jojo Diaz is in a bit of a, you know, a, I don't know. He's in a, in a situation in his career where for – a, a while now since after the Tevin Farmer win, it's just not been going his way. He's only 31. He keeps trying. And you brought up matchmaking and, and, and you know, it not being as easy as two fighters wanting to fight, which it seems like JoJo and Floyd Schofield Diaz have been wanting to do for a while. That has not been able to manifest. Um, do you think it's because... They just don't believe JoJo can win that fight because of the way it's been looking in the past three years. I mean, he's only had one win since that Tevin Farmer. Well, yeah, he got the Javier Fortuna win, excuse me, uh, after the Tevin Farmer. But uh, two wins in, you know, three years. So with JoJo, and here I'm just speculating, but this is what I see. I mean, JoJo, I signed him. JoJo came right out of the Olympics and I signed him was off to a great start, uh, made a mandatory in two different organizations. Credit to JoJo. Hey, we get to pick, choose which champion this way, WBO or WBC. He goes, I want the best one. I want Gary Russell. Okay. There was no reason to believe he couldn't beat Gary. As talented as Gary is, I did a lot of Gary's fights, and I, I always say this kid's very talented. But JoJo was young, talented as well, Olympian. Let's go. Let's go do it. If we can beat Gary, hey, you're the number one guy in the division. He came up short with, with Gary. And something that you look back, and I'm very proud of this one. You look back. He lost a, a close decision, whatever, but Gary won the fight. And JoJo's next fight for the WBA world title. Nobody remembers that. JoJo's, he didn't get a, he didn't have to come out and win a fight and then fight for the world title. His very next fight, he's fighting for the WBA world title against Jesus Rojas. That's something that I made happen. But what happened was JoJo didn't make weight. So he fights Rojas, beats Rojas, but doesn't walk away with the belt. That was very frustrating for me. I was, JoJo, please, please go try your last-ditch effort to make the weight. You're going to win, and you're going to walk away with no title. I can't, I can't, I can't. I'm, I'm done. I can't. I'll pay the fine. And that was unfortunate. Move on forward. As as what I'm seeing now is, yeah, JoJo went into a slump. Um, for whatever reason, his outside distractions, 
um, really, really put an effect on him. He lost to William Cepeda. People are seeing what William Cepeda is now doing. It's going to be very hard to beat him. I signed William. I loved when I saw the first time I saw William, a friend of mine, uh, photographer Liz De Los Santos brought him to me and said, take a look at this kid, see what you think. And I see this little machine throwing so many punches and I'm like, wow, let me meet him. Let me talk to him. Let me meet with his team. And then we signed him. And Mercito Gesta, then this latest one. Now, I know it's a no-brainer. Floyd Schofield is the kid coming up, the young superstar in the making. He needs a Jojo Diaz on his resume. He needs a former world champion on his resume. That's perfect. And Jojo, hey, look, you're in a spot right now, man, that uh, this is like a sink or swim for you. You're going to fight Schofield. But what happened was in between making that fight, they put in this kid, Ricky Perez. Now, Ricky had fought on a Golden Boy show. He fought Alexis Rocha. Alexis, the welterweight thing. Couldn't drop him, couldn't stop him. Won every round, but Ricky was there. So it's like, when I saw that fight announced, I'm like, oh, man, why Ricky? Ricky could take a punch. Jojo's not a big puncher. Ricky's in there throwing punches back from a big guy. Of but Robert, who, who filled that position? Because isn't that the matchmaker's role to know not to put Perez in there? It, it, it should be, yeah. I don't know who did that fight. I don't know why. Um, I think, hey, Ricky Perez is an opponent. But somebody forgot to tell Ricky Perez, hey, you're the opponent, okay? And, and at the same time, I think JoJo got to a point where he's, he got a little comfortable with, I could just do enough, you know, and show up and I'm going to win. I think this really sparked a, a, a light in JoJo, another loss. You know, that's that's three losses, four losses, if you include Haney, Haney, Cepeda, Mercito, Ricky Perez. I mean, that shouldn't be how JoJo's career ends. But again, a, a lot has to do on JoJo too, his discipline. I think we're seeing a different JoJo because his back's on the wall, against the wall. And now he's fighting Duarte. It's a It's a... Sink or swim for both, but it is a fight that you have to favor Duarte, the physically guy that's in his division. Jojo, if I, if I, if I, I had it my way, Jojo would be back down to between 130 and 135 if he could fight. You know, I know he can't make 130 anymore. You know, with age, it gets tougher I'm, and tougher. I'm glad that you are saying this because let me tell you, on this program, we take callers, and there's a lot of people that think JoJo will be Oscar Duarte. I guess it's the Ryan Garcia effect. They don't want to give Garcia credit. They want to believe he's not a real boxer, but I think Duarte is a, 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 a solid opponent, very he's Very durable, solid. And very he punches, durable. Very strong. Yeah, he punches hard. I, I don't think JoJo can beat him. You know, yes, Duarte's moving up. is only a second fight at 40, but he was very strong at 35, and I only see him stronger at 40. Ryan was fast. That shoulder roll, people laugh at Ryan, but he was effective offensively out of that shoulder roll. He's coming but out of that shoulder Ryan roll with three punches. Punch. People exactly. don't remember. Ryan can punch. I'm not saying it's powerful like like a Canelo punch with where it comes with all the power and the strength. But Ryan has knocked out Fonseca, who went rounds with Davis, has knocked out Duno, who's very dur He can knock you out with one punch because it's that explosiveness, that speed, the one you don't see coming. Duarte didn't, I mean, Duarte has probably got hit with better shots in his past fights. However, Duarte's walking in, coming with force, Ryan's coming back and turning that punch in and catches him with that shot that you don't expect coming, that you don't tighten up for and see it coming and take it. No. Boom. You caught me when I wasn't ready for it. That's Ryan. Ryan can knock you out like this with one punch. What, what's your thoughts on Ryan? I mean, you've been working with him for a while, and, and obviously you probably have no dealings at this point. I don't know, but... The world doesn't know if he's just promoting, if he's losing his mind, if he's having another mental breakdown. He suffered with, uh, you know, mental health issues in the past. Do you think this is a new way of promoting for Ryan? Ryan's very intelligent. Ryan is very different. 
and I say that in a, in a good way. He's very different because what he's done with social media as a boxer, it can't be replicated. I mean, no other fighter's done what he's done. I mean, think of it. Ryan hasn't been a world champion, and look at the following he has. He's done an amazing job with that. Um, so I want to say I, the mental illness that he's had in the past, the stress, the anxiety, I believe that 100% to have, have happened. This is a young man that had so much, I'm not saying too soon, but so much at one time to carry for an adult is a lot of pressure. And, and at a young age, he carried a lot on his shoulders and a lot of pressures and a lot of decisions. And not just as a fighter, you want to be able to get in that ring and not have to worry about other stuff. You have enough to worry about, about your opponent, your life on the line. But when you have a lot of things going on at the same time, and I'm even saying, you know, Ryan has a lot of businesses outside of boxing because of the social media, because he's so big, because he's a star there. So a lot going on so fast. What I see right now, yeah, I was even like, whoa, this is not the Ryan I know. And not even what he's posting or saying, just a press conference of F-bombs here, F-bombs there. That wasn't Ryan. But there comes a point where the little boy, the young man turns into a man. And, you know, there's so many people around this. You should do this. You should do that. You should say this. And you start. And some things stake here, stake. They come out all of a sudden because I remember him saying it. I believe it is a way of him promoting uh, in a different way that we have never seen before. We've never been on social media. If we wouldn't have social media, this wouldn't have been coming out. And he couldn't have expressed himself. I believe some of the stuff that he he truly believes it and, and is trying to say, if I'm at the stage of focus where people listen to me and hear me, well... This is what I want to let the people know. But I also believe that he is there to win. Uh, I would have personally like as a as a Ryan, someone that worked with Ryan all most of his career, done a lot of his fights, seen him grow. I would have liked to have seen a couple more fights with Derek James to adjust more to the weight, to to get on a parallel activity and mind tested for his own good like Haney. Haney's been through fire. Haney fought Lomachenko, one of the highest IQs in boxing that we've ever seen and whether people believe Haney won or lost, that's not the point. He was there and made it that close that people think he lost or won whatever, but for a young kid, this young still, to be matching IQ with a fighter as advanced as Lomachenko, who had 300 amateur fights, that's very impressive. For a fighter at his age to go to Australia twice and beat and then go back and defend, that's ma that's mind battling. That's a, a battle of the minds. That this is a young man who knows I cannot be beat. Where Ryan needed a little bit more, in my personal opinion, of... I've been tested and I've gone through that. You know, at one time I wanted to do Ryan and JoJo and I thought that would have been a hell of a fight in LA. I tried. And especially before the Gervonta fight, I said, Ryan, Gervonta before, you know, uh, JoJo before Gervonta. He's a southpaw, about the same height. And guess what? JoJo's rugged, tough. You're going to see that with Gervonta. You're going to have to be adjusted to that. But he didn't want, you know, it, it was a personal thing with JoJo. Nah, he's talk crap. Blah, blah. They didn't want to fight JoJo. But I thought that would have been a hell of a fight in L.A. Because they both would have brought in their crowd. I, I think I would have preferred to see battle tested. Now, on the other side of the, on the flip side of the coin is, I love where this new generation is going now. We're getting away from these guys fighting when they're 35. They're now willing to test each other in their early 20s, like it should be. Like it should be. Teofimo fought Lomachenko. Teofimo, you know, taking these chances. Devin, of course. Ryan now fought Gervonta. Now he's going to fight Haney, two of the top in the, in the world of boxing. So I'm liking where this new generation is going, that they're taking risks, and the zero is not the most important thing now. They're seeing that, hey, I can lose a fight. Canelo's lost, and he's still on top of the game. Um, 
What sort of shot are you giving Ryan in this fight? Um, Devin is not the same person that he was when when he jumped in the ring with Ryan on the zone all those years ago. Uh, Devin's gone on to undispute win titles in multiple divisions, where Ryan, you know, um, has only beat Duarte since then, really. Um, yeah, what what sort of shot do you give him? Well, that's why I said I, I would have liked to see Ryan a little bit more active, gone through a little bit more tests, gone through a little bit more fire, not because of more than anything of so that in his mind, I've been there, I've done it, I got cut, I, I fought on, I want for his own sake. Uh, Devin has gone through it. He's not the little boy. Devin went from little boy to young man to a man. Devin believes 100%. Devin's dedicated 100%. He's full-time 100%. So what kind of shot? The puncher shot. Uh, Ryan has the puncher shot to, to catch Devin and hurt him. They are not the same fighters they were when the amateurs. That for sure. That's out the window. That's out the door. You got a much better fighter in Devin today than whatever he was at the, as good as he was at the amateurs. You have a much physically man now with Ryan, but I believe uh, I believe it favors right now the rhythm. I mean, obviously my heart's with Ryan. I've always ridden with Ryan. I I worked with Ryan, but I have to favor Devin based on the momentum of where they are now going into the fight. Right, Devin has this way, and I, I I faced him with Linares, I faced him with Jojo, and then I became a fan. He has a way of controlling your pace. He has a beautiful jab. He controls your output. Look at Combosis against Yofimo, look at Combosis against him. You know, when Linares fought him, if you remember the first eight, right, nine rounds, Linares couldn't get off, couldn't, and I thought, okay, Father Time inactivity is hurting Linares. But then Jojo, same thing. Cambosis, same thing. Regis, Regis, I think, broke a record for, for, for the lowest output. And in, in, that's Devin, though. It's not, it can't be one guy or this guy. It, and when it's all of them together, that has to be Devin. Something that Floyd did very well. Control you have a lot of face. experience. How do you interpret what people, the perception of Devin, right? Uh, we're getting phone calls where they're calling him a boring fighter. Um, but I, you know, it's fan bases. Yes. I believe it's the tank fan base, you know, that calls Devin boring or not economical. He doesn't sell because that style isn't conducive to what tank does. Um, but as a matchmaker, knowing what networks want on television, is Devin Haney that? Or is he in that gray area where, yeah, he can be exciting, but he can also be what television considers boring? Or is that just a myth to try to put him down, not to get those big fights? 100% is a myth. Devin's not boring. That's the responsibility as well as the matchmaker. Hey, it takes two to tangle. I could have a great fighter in a boring fight. I could have a very exciting fight in a boring fight. If I match him up with somebody that's holding and tying and running, I mean, it's a stinker of a fight. And we've seen that not just with Devin, with other fighters, but it takes two to tangle. I love watching Devin. Again, one side, I said, okay, it wasn't a fluke. You know, with Linares, okay, we're going to win. I, I was confident there as well. We're going to take a young man to school. He doesn't have the experience. You can't buy experience. You're going to have to go through it which is what he's done. But I thought at that time, oh, Jorge's just going to school him. He slows Jorge's pace down. He slows Jojo's pace down. He's, he's very, he makes you be conservative. And that's because of his IQ. I mean, with Lomachenko, that was an exciting, that was a hell of a, I, I loved it. I enjoyed the fight. Did you think he, he won? Because a I, lot of people say they, you know, he did or he didn't win. I gave the fight at the end before the decision. I thought Lomachenko won by one round. But that's where people have to understand. If if you think one guy won by one point or the other guy won by one point, it's not a robbery. 
It's not a robbery because one round that I might have seen close or given it to one guy could have gone to the other guy. So I was not upset. Even even before the decision, I said, I think Loma won, but Devin won already, regardless, because he's competing at this high of a level with this kind of fighter, and he's right in there. If they would have given it a draw, I'm okay with it. If they would have gave, they, they gave it to Devin, I was okay with it. They would have given it to Lomachenko, I would have been, but one way, one point, either way. Um, but he's matched, and I think that's where he's growing. That's where he mentally gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was killing him to make 135. I mean, I saw him two times that way. So today at 140, I could see him going up to 47 easily in a couple, in a year, in another year. And so is Ryan. I I could see Ryan going to 54, maybe even 60, if you know, because he's he's so big upper his upper body is so big. Um, again, mat- matchmaking standpoint, uh, Floyd Schofield, his father, they believe they beat Devin, they beat Shakur. You know, they've been calling out these top names, but since. And again, I, I guess you can feel, you maybe you feel like you can't answer since you're no longer with the company. Since Alberto Mercado, they've sidestepped Floyd Schofield. He hasn't gone forward. The only forward fight that they've quote unquote attempted to make is the JoJo fight. But any other name that they mention or that sticks is less than Mercado. Did you see something in the Mercado fight that you believe made them pull the pump the brakes did- on Schofield? I did the Mercado fight. Before I left, the fight was already done. I did the Mercado fight. It was a fight that uh, I, I I wanted to do. I know everybody was high on Floyd, but it was it's a process. And it has to be little by little, gradually building and building and building because you can't go from A to Z and 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 then and jump over in the in-between. You have to the fighter has to struggle a fight. You have to little by little progress. And when they're flying, when they're passing flying colors, even when you're stepping them up like a Virgil Ortiz, knocking everybody out, okay, then I'll step up again and step up again and step up again. And he continues to knock these guys out. Then you're like, wow, this is something special. Schofield has a lot of talent. He's a hard worker, good-looking kid. I think he is definitely on his way to becoming one of that next-generation stars. Because he definitely trains hard. He has the package. Great smile. It's not just about being hard 24-7. You got to hard and then switch it off. And and he gets it. But what's the rush when you're this young? Baby steps. Baby step. Don't try to go too fast because that's where it's, it's, a, a, it's so easy to get uh, – to, to do it too fast. See, sometimes if you go too slow, it's bad. Then you want to rush it when it's too late. But if you go too fast, you can ruin a career too. So it's like, it's a fine line, but I don't understand what the rush is. I mean, I, I remember being told you got to put him on co-main event for that Mercado fight. And it's like, as long as he's in the opener, because he's getting TV exposure, but the opponent, little by little, by the end of the year, he could be on the co-main event. But what's the co-main event? Then by the year, end of the year, main event. But if you go main event, you got to have a main event type opponent. The espacio is better. You're going to get there, and you're going to get there perfectly fine. Um, Do you believe... Golden Boy will sign Shakur. Shakur obviously is not re-signing. Um, I'm sure you've heard that throughout the industry. Where do you see Shakur ending up? I don't know any James Prince fighter, Antonio Lettered, co-promoted fighter, not with Top Rank. Um, you've been in the business longer uh, by about 10 years. Is there anyone that's ever been with James and not with Top Rank? Um, Ward was with Goosen for a little bit, but, uh, ah, that's right. yeah. yeah, um, I don't see Shakur going anywhere else. I mean, um, I, I, I don't see it. I, I read recent, I think today or yesterday, oh, that Bob said something like, yeah, he's not, he hasn't resigned or something like that. But, uh, 
I really think that's where the fights are. That's his home. I think, you know, what they need to do, social media is killing because they, the kid, these guys are, and I'm say, I, I say kids because I'm not much older, but they speak their mind off right away real quick. I think they need to sit down at the table. I, that's how I like. I like the old school way. Let's sit down, work things out. Because the more they throw things outside publicly, yeah, it's great news for the fans and media and everything. But there's more uh, damage being done on both sides than to sit down and say, let's work things out. What What is it that you don't like? What is it that you like? What is it you're looking for? What is it, you know? I think Shakur, like when he said he was going to retire, we all knew he wasn't going to retire. Teofimo, I'm retired. We knew he wasn't. Okay, give up the belts then. That cost you so much to get him. It's a new way of like, uh, I need attention. I need to sit down. I'm going to catch your attention. I'm not happy. I'm not, you know, and we're seeing it not just with one, with the other. You know, Ryan's had his, you know, things with, with Golden Boy. And I think everybody needs to like, okay, this is your business. Sit down as a businessman and work it out. But I think uh, Shakur, obviously, I mean, a fight with Oscar Valdez, a fight with Navarrete, a fight. I mean, these, there's so many fights out there uh, that could be made. Where else? PBC. But then again, the relationship from past and this, it, it's, you know, can can everybody set it aside in its business? Because imagine Shakur against Gervonta. I mean, that, that's a fight that people will buy. Matchroom because then there's Haney. I, I think top think ranks Shakur, in home. You think Shakur's a big enough star where James Prince can, you know, change his business ways? And because you like you said previous relationships were, I'm assuming you talk about mm -hmm. you know the Floyd thing with with James. Mm -hmm. So like, how can Shakur really go over there? But if we bury the hatchet, then it's the betterment of the fighter. Mm -hmm. um, can you see that? James is a businessman. I could see that on that, you know, uh, if it benefits Shakur. I just think that right now they're, they have a home and it's, you know, it's it's easier to fix things. If, if there is something to be fixed, I, I don't know because I'm on the outside, but the fights are there to be made. It's just negotiate them. And, and I think a, a lot that we have to see too is – a reset of there is no more HBO. There is no more Showtime. There has to be a reset. And that has to start on the level of all promoters of saying, okay, look, fighters need to get paid. Yes. But fighters need to also, and that's where I also enjoy this part more. Having worked with the promotion for so many years, now working with fighters, understand the promoters have to make money. It's a business. Understand the fighters have to make money. It's their life on their line. But there was a point where it got out of control. And, oh, they're paying this much, we're going to pay more. Oh, they're paying that much more, we're going to pay more, more, more. And, yes, at the end, it benefited a lot of fighters, but it wasn't sustainable. And what you want is to create a fair market value where it sustains and it's doable for the long term. And you're not trying to... Well, I pay my guys more so that the other promoters, their fighters hear it and want to leave them and want to come over here. There's enough in the business. And what promoters need to do is say, let's get together. My guy fights your guy. Look, I, when I was at Golden Boy, I kept pushing and pushing and pushing. Once a year, at the end of the year, let's do Golden Boy against Macho on a zone card. I mean, we, we're both under the same umbrella. Let's do it once a year, our best against your best. And guess what? My guys were going to lose sometimes. My guys were going to win sometimes. It'd be friendly competition. It, 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 you know, gives you a little fight. Oh, man, they got me this time. I got to get them back next time. The fans win. Boxing wins. And the fighters make a lot of money because at the end of the day, fans ha would are, are not worried about the zero as much as good fighters fighting each other. They'll pay to come back and see the guy that lost, that fought his... You know, I was at the PBC show the other day. Pitbull wins. And I hadn't heard a crowd like that in ages. They went crazy. I mean, take it, there was a lot of Mexicans, but I didn't think Pitbull had that attraction. But the cr crowd went crazy. And people, even Danny Garcia, I saw interviews later, man, this Pitbull, 
he won over a lot of people. And it wasn't, it, it was the His just social humble media guy. numbers have, uh, I mean, it's a, it's insane, uh, you know, yeah. in the amount of hours, how they just keep rising since that fight. Um, and he's lost a couple fights. And, yep. and at, look, I'm a fan of Pitbull, but as a boxing guy, I don't, I mean, he comes forward, throws madrazos, chingazos, but there's no feints. There's no like boxing. He just comes forward. Maybe that's what people like and great, you know, that to each their own, but. He's earned so much love of the people because he gives it 100%. But it's not like I'm watching a clinic. I know what I'm going to get with Pitbull. And maybe that's what they like. You know, obviously, being in the game, I want to see a little bit more of the feint, the head movement, the, the sidestep and this and that. Maybe he didn't need it in this fight, but all applause, the way the people went crazy on Pitbull. Even in Mexico, they're drawing arts all over the streets now and everything. People, people, he's the thing right now. And and props to him. Now he's a world champion. He earned it. He deserved it. But that's what I'm saying. The people went crazy. There you have like a new face of boxing for, for Mexico. Obviously, you know, being a matchmaker <laughs> now, an advisor, uh, he's not your fighter. I'm not asking you to give professional advice, but... If you were with Pitbull, what would you recommend? Because there's reports that he's saying him and his team have to talk to decide whether he's going to stay at 40 or drop back down to 35. After the win, what do you think would be best? Look, it reminds me of Saddam Ali. He wins the world title against Miguel Cotto at 54. Right? But he's not a 54-pounder. So... You try to go back to 47, your natural, your better weight, because not even 47, he was small. Mm -hmm. But how do you tell a fighter, you're now a world champion, but go back. Remember the contracts. As a world champion, I'm going to make X. But if I'm not a world champion now, I'm going to make Z. Then screw it. I'll, I won the world title. I beat him great. I might as well stay here. So it's hard. Yes. He's 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 small, and if he can make 35, go back to 35 and campaign to 35. But start all over again? When you're at 40, as a world champion, and we may be at a disadvantage against the other champions, but purse-wise, we're at an advantage to say we'll fight the Theo, we'll fight the Haney, we'll fight uh, the Asia. Javante, you, give me the rematch that I've been wanting, but it's at 140 for my title. I think that's what we'll probably see more. Javante could go up to 140 and now become champion, and now he's a player back in there, and then he got the rematch out of the way too. So it, it unless they make some kind of arrangement where Javante goes to 140 and fights for the vacant title that Pitbull leaves, and Pitbull could go to 35 and fight for the vacant title that Javante leaves, then it's a win-win for both of them. But how do you say walk away from a big payday as a champion? I earned it. I want to defend it, and that's what happened with Saddam. You know, with Saddam, I remember saying, let's fight, good fight against Eddie Gomez. We had Eddie Gomez. I said, I'll give Eddie a shot at the title. Eddie's from the Bronx. Saddam's from Brooklyn. No, we're not going to fight Eddie. I think there was some personal stuff. Then I said, Rashidi Ellis. No, we're not going to fight Rashidi Ellis. Then the Munguia name came out of nowhere. And it was like, yeah, we'll fight Munguia. And it was like, oh, okay. And obviously, Munguia was physically too big. Too big, too strong. And because Saddam, you know, props to him, he beat a Miguel Cotto who tore his bicep in the second round and fought one armed. Uh, that was Miguel's last fight, regardless if he would have won. He had already decided, this is it. I'm going to retire in the garden. And that's a career. So Saddam wins the title. And again, props to him. He wanted the fight so bad. And of course, you lose to a legend like Miguel Cotto, there's no shame. But you win, and you're starting. But unfortunately, he didn't go on to – if the right thing now, if you look at it Monday night after, is go back to 47. But again, the Saddam, finally I'm here. Finally I'm a world champion. Finally I'm going to get those big, big paydays. Oh, no, let me give it up and now go to really where my body really adjusts and, and has a better chance. Or do you say let's get that payday? Um, a, a fight the top rank just announced. I wanted to just get your thoughts. What sort of chance does he have? If you're familiar with Brian Norman Jr. taking on uh, the big welterweight Giovanni Stantilian, you must know him because of his win over Rocha, who you're familiar mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. Um, 
What sort of chances you give Norman? I mean, I'm getting cash out vibes from top rank with Brian Norman. Norman, on the other hand, and his father seriously believe they could beat uh, Giovanni. I had talked to him even before this fight was announced and before the fight with uh, Boca Chica and uh, Giovanni was on the table for them. They had already said yes to that, but then they had the Boca Chica um, performance where it, no contest, headbutts. And it just has not been looking good for Norman. Can he pull it off because he's rising to the occasion? Sometimes fighters step up to the level of competition and fight down to the level of competition. Well, one thing you can never count out is when, the, when there's a very confident fighter. A very confident fighter gives you that security that, trust me, I'm going to win, I'm going to win, I'm going to win. Obviously, an undefeated fighter is supposed to be that way. you know. But Giovanni's coming off such a big win that his confidence also boosted up. And not just a, a, a small boost. Giovanni comes in as an opponent and walks in, walks out as the winner. And now he's coming in as you're bringing me an opponent. Now I am the winner. Now I am the A-side. And I'm being treated that way. Uh, Giovanni, I think, has you have to give him the edge 100%. And this is... Norman's test. He's gonna he's gonna be tested, and it it is a tough test. So, I like his confidence. I mean, this you know when you tell me that they had already accepted him before, that's. But sometimes, you have to your team, has to say no. I mean, there was times where Omar Figueroa would say, "Hey, I'll fight Omar Chavez right now," and I'm like, "It's not time." We're we're at eight fights. Uh, Renato Gomez told me I want to fight Lomachenko when he was, you know, early on, or I'll fight Ryan Garcia. I said, no, that's not business right now. We got to wait till it's business. Uh, so sometimes your team, you have to hold back your fighter. You love to hear the confidence. I hate it when, uh, no, give me two more fights. I'm, I'm not ready for this guy. That's like, what? But when you have a fighter that says, yes, I'm ready. I'll fight whoever. Who do you want? I got this guy. Oh, yeah, let's do it. You love that confidence. But sometimes the team has to say, not yet. Let's get momentum. Let's get momentum. Let's see how, you know, with, with, with Rocha, I always wanted to do Antonio DeMarco. I wanted to do Antonio DeMarco because, number one, you had a former world champion. Number two, Southpaw, you're getting him ready for Spencer Crawford. Number three, in the eyes of many, myself included, I thought he beat Santillan. So I would have gone the Antonio DeMarco side more than the Santillan side, because it was like, and with all due respect to DeMarco, he was a world champion at 35, 40, but not a 47 pounder. And he's towards the end. So I like that one more. I, I talked to when I was at Golden Boy to Rocha and his team about it. And that's who I was targeting. Again, the Southpaw, uh, prepare you for Spence, for Crawford, whoever won that fight, or for either if they didn't fight each other former world champion, and in the eyes of many, had beat Santillan. When Santillan was done, I was like, oh, oh okay, this is a tough fight, a good fight, good fight. They knew each other, they sparred each other. And I was surprised. That's where Santillan rose to the occasion. Um. So... Sugar Shane Mosley Jr., why do you, well, first and foremost, in your time with Mosley Jr., um, has the Berlanga fight ever been offered? No. In my time with Jr., no. No, we talked about, I mean, obviously I did the Quigley fight. Uh, I did the Rosado fight. Uh, there was fights, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe I talked about a Munguia fight. Uh, Berlanga, no, never came, at, at least when I was there, never crossed my mind, never was approached or talked about. Berlanga was with top rank, um, so there wasn't, like, a lot of work between that. And then when he went to matchroom, um, uh, yeah, no, that fight never never came through. In fact, the only reason it was done with, with Jason Quigley was because at that time I had gone, Jason was no longer with Golden Boy. And we got the win to, for him to retire in Ireland. And then the call came and said, hey, would you be interested in a Berlanga fight? What's your thoughts on Berlanga? I mean, uh, the, the, the audience seems to be split. They either think he's a hype job or uh, he's a superstar. 
Um, how good can he be? He seems to be refocused, dialed in. He's moved away from New York City. He's in Tampa. But, uh, you know, his last fight still is McCory, not one of the top names at 68. I think with Berlanga, and, and again, people have to understand and be patient. Look, Berlanga knocked out, what, with 14 of his first opponents all in the first round. So he didn't he didn't grow much with experience in the rounds because the first 14 fights were 14 rounds. He's now getting that experience and getting that. I was at the Orlando fight, his last one, McCoy, because I had Kano against Giasov. I sat there and watched him because he had just beaten Jason. I saw some flaws in the Jason Quigley fight. You know, Jason heard him a couple times as Berlanga walked in to, and got caught with some jabs. I saw a much more composed fighter in this last fight. Not as reckless. And that's what he's going to need going into these fights against these bigger, tougher guys that now have more experience that are going to want him to come in reckless and get caught with something. So I liked what I saw in this last fight. Regardless of who the opponent was, the um, way he fought, he was composed. Oh, no, 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 go ahead. No, no, no. I don't want you to shorten your answer because I interrupted. Go ahead. Well, I, I just liked what I saw. I saw patient. And what comes with patience is your breathing is more controlled so you don't get tired as much. And what, was, what could happen with a Berlanga because of all the knockouts in the first round, after three or four rounds, I'm tired now because I didn't knock you out in the first two or three rounds like I'm supposed to. So now in the deep end, I might get beat by a guy because he took me into rounds. That, so getting the rounds is important, but also learning to a pace, fight at a slower pace, fight at a not so rushed. You're not going to make mistakes. You're going to see things slower. And that's what I saw a more experienced Berlanga. And he still knocked him out and looked good at it. Absolutely. Um, so, can Berlanga beat Diego Pacheco, in your opinion? Uh, he seems to have had a change of heart since Pacheco's latest fight with Sean McCallum. Uh, he's called him, you know, flat out a bum and believes he can beat him. Um should Matchroom take that chance on Berlanga's last fight? Uh, do you see that as a company, or would that fight only happen if he re-signs? And, and how does that fight play out? I wouldn't do the fight because now I have, I'm going to eliminate one player from that division to fight one of the big guys. And I'd rather have two than one. Um, I think it's a fun fight because they're both very similar. They're both seek and destroy um obviously it sells mexico against puerto rico uh, but if i'm matchroom i try to take both to that promised land of saying okay you both go in there and fight for the big big guy if if they can get there and yeah if one of if both of them lose or something then they can fight each other that fight's always going to be fun and exciting and people will tune in but if i'm the business part says you both have to go in there and fight a Munguia or fight a Canelo, whoever wins in that fight. So I, I take it that would be the same mindset that you and Golden Boy had when, quote-unquote, allegedly turned down offers from uh, Andre and Charlo for 160 for Munguia. Uh, why do you think, you know, you guys didn't accept an Andre or a Charlo offer for Munguia? Andre had a very difficult style. Uh, I, t I spoke to Andre after the fight with, with uh, Benavides. I congratulated him. I said, hey, you showed a lot of heart and everything, but, you know, you maybe fought in there too much against this this monster. You should have boxed more and been the Andre before. Maybe what people say, the boring one, but that would have been the smarter thing maybe. But obviously it's easy after the fact, no? But I gave him a lot of commendum uh, for showing that heart and, and, and sticking in there. With Charlo, Charlo turned it down. Charlo turned it down. Oscar offered him a fight, and, and they said, uh, I'm not saying Charlo personally. His team turned it down and said, look, uh, we're far apart. So the fight never progressed. But it was a fight that Munguia did want against Charlo. And why not Benavidez? Was it simply if we agree to fight Benavidez, we lose the opportunity at Canelo? Because Benavidez and his father seem to believe that 
They agreed to 50-50. Everything was done, and then Jaime and his team pulled out. There was a moment where Beltran and, and the team said, yeah, hey, you, we'll fight. They even, even Bivol. I remember uh, when Bivol beat Canelo that, you know, Jaime, Jaime and Fernando said, hey, get us Bivol, get us Bivol. But it's crazy to even think at the moment that it was like, get us next, because I think Jaime was still 160 and to go jump, to 175 just like that now nah, you got to gradually get there and and look i commend fernando and and i remember living it through with deontay wilder where people are ah he's only fighting this he's only fighting bums he's only fighting cans he's all well you're grooming you're grooming you're grooming you're 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 bettering you see a little flaw here let's fix this let's fix that let's fix but look where fernando and, and mungia are now this is where you want to be few weeks away from the biggest fight that Munguia could have ever made. Who knows if he would have fought Golovkin a few years ago, if we would have even been here today. But I say something that I've learned with experience is God's timing is perfect. And it and it's so true. And right now, Munguia is probably, yeah, could have been one more or two more under Freddy to get, but could Canelo have retired in one or two more of Munguia's or, I think it's a perfect time. It is a good, good fight. I see a eh, couple things. Um, Munguia is physically, he's young, he's strong. He hasn't been beaten, so he's fresh. He throws a lot of punches. It's what Munguia shows up. Does Munguia come to try to win, but win impressively to try to knock out Canelo? Does Munguia say, let's be smart and box, and Freddie, hey, let's box and be smart and don't get caught? That depends on the outcome of the fight, what Munguia brings. I, I, we know what Canelo brings, and, and we know, but we also know, and this is what's exciting about this fight, and again, I'm not promoting it anymore, but when you get two Mexicans in the ring, I, I know the cliche, oh, you get a warrior. It, it, it's more than just that. It's, I can lose, we saw with Barrera Morales so many times. Barrera can lose to Junior Jones. There's no hatred. They get along. He could lose to this guy. That Morales lost to a uh, uh, kid, Rahim, and he was cool. He lost to Pacquiao. He was cool. But it's almost like I can't lose to a fellow countryman. I, I, if I go back to Mexico, I still got to be number one, no matter what happens. So I think that, the pride, the honor, just gives it the recipe of a can't miss. I see a hell of a fight while it lasts. I obviously, I worked with both of them for many years. Um, but I don't see it going the distance. I see a knockout. And we know Canelo has a chin of granite. So, um, but I see a hell of a fight while it lasts. And I, I, I couldn't be surprised too, because you never know. In, in, a, in a sense, you never know when Father Time says, hey, I'm here, and you can't you can't avoid me. You never know. Speaking of avoiding, uh, is your per what's your personal opinion? Does Canelo give the public the Benavidez fight, or is it too much for us to ask for him to fight Benavidez? I've known Canelo since he was 15 years old. And this is when we mentioned Danny Garcia. There was fights I told Canelo and the team not to take. One of them being Austin Trout, one of them being Lada. And Canelo's never, never been a guy to say no to a fight, no to an opponent. I think it, it's more of a, I just don't like your approach and, and, and how you're doing. And at the same time, where nobody's giving them the credit where you won't fight Lada, you won't fight Trout, you won't fight Golovkin. So he fights uh, Bivol, he fights Kovalev way out of his comfort zone and yet still oh but he won't fight benavides now and he won't fight it's like it doesn't matter he fights benavides tomorrow they say well he won't fight usik <laughs> you know there's always going to be something and that's just a sign of one boxing fans are never happy they never enjoy the moment once canelo leaves and retires people be like man but when canelo enjoyed what we have now um, I think he'd fight Benavides. I, I, I do like the fight. Obviously, as a fan, I think it's a hell of a fight. But 
and with all due respect, I I, I love uh, the Benavides. I, I'm real close with his father and everything, but that's stylistically. And we go back into the matchmaking and styles make fights. That's a much better fight for Canelo, for the Can for Canelo style. That's the style that actually makes Canelo look like fire. Benavides? Angulo, yes, Angulo came at him. Kirkland came at him. Anybody that ca comes at him to fire, let's go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, Canelo's a master counterpuncher. He's a master counterpuncher. And now at the at, at the at the IQ level that he's at, it does it's not a lot of shots. Remember Mayweather. It's just the, that the right shots, the right timing, the right moment. I think that's that's what we see with Canelo and Benavides. Hell of a fight, of course. But ben, David gets hit. David throws a lot of punches. David gets hit. That that's one thing that favors David. He throws a lot of punches. But when you throw a lot of punches, you're open to a lot of counter punches. Obviously, it's it's the fight that you know uh, people are gonna uh, everything's gonna close down and all eyes here, but. I think people are going to see and 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 say, wow. You know, a lot of people say he's flat-footed. A lot of people say he's slow. But once they're in the ring, like, oh, shit, he's not as slow as I thought. Oh, he, he hits harder than – he's harder to hit than I thought. Danny Jacobs missed a lot with against Canelo with all the head movement and, you know, bending and everything. It can bring it out. Who can bring it out? I think we'll see a little bit with Munguia. I think Mungia is going to bring out some of that what we haven't been seeing lately. Did you get... Uh, do you still have time? I don't want to keep you. No, no, no. Of course. Absolutely. Did you... Uh, were you as shocked as most boxing fans when we heard Canelo say he needed $200 million to fight uh, Benavides? Or did you take it as tongue-in-cheek? He's not really asking for that. He's just fucking around. I was shocked. I was shocked. But... With Canelo, it it's look, he's at a point right now. I think there's nothing to prove. Um, do I think somebody's gonna come and say here's 150, 200 million? No. Again, we have to in boxing in a whole in general, we have to stabilize that. We have to bring back that 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 market value to to now. Can somebody pay that? You never know. It's, it, could I ever dream that somebody was going to be paying a fighter $50 million for a fight? No. No. I didn't think we're there. I don't think we're there, but we are. <laughs> but that's what you're hearing. Pay, fighters get paid and this and that. Now, the more the merrier. Okay, great. But I don't – I was shocked in the sense of I, – I, personally, I'd rather somebody not say that. It, it not, not put a tag on it. You know, hey, if the fans want it, we'll get it. If if if, if he earns it, if he doesn't limit or if he beats this guy, I'd rather it go the old fashioned way. But do I see it happening? I think so. I think so. He's never, never, never ducked the fight. I mean, I'm telling you, he eh, the Bivol fight, the Kobolev fight, never dream. I mean, think of it. My uh Saul started at one forty seven to be fighting at one seventy five. One forty those two yeah, Sugar Ray did it, but, you know, that's where he is. That's the kind of fight. I'm not saying he's Sugar Ray, but he is one of those fighters that does take challenges and does take fights, and and he could have been fighting Joe Blows for the rest of his career and then just call it a day. He's still going to get paid that kind of money, but at the same time, I do always see him. I've known him for many years of – I want to go down as one of the greatest. I want legacy is important to me. The money he knows is going to come. He is a smart businessman in that part. Um, Last one on that, Canelo Benavidez. Do you think this is all just him trying to get that mega payday that Canelo uh, Pacquiao Mayweather got? Uh, because, uh, you know, he, he's literally said, and I quote, I want nothing to do with that fight, end quote. Is he just playing hardball like a like a, a beautiful girlfriend that you can't take out on a date? She wants you to keep courting her. What, or, or is he just at a point where he's frustrated that we hadn't given him credit, um, I guess, universally for the things that he did do? 
I I do see it as that as I think he understands that look you're never going to please everybody the people that support him that love him that follow him that are with him he's they're not they're not asking for the Ben be this fight those are who he sees those are my real fans those are my real supporters the people that are begging and then there's the, in the middle fans that don't that maybe are not his followers or not Benavidez followers but understand that this is a hell of a fight I want to see it as a fight okay but then the ones that naysakers that are always attacking him that oh you won't fight this guy because it's the same group the same people that say he won't fight this guy he won't fight that guy so it's like even if I fight Benavidez tomorrow you'll come out with somebody else I think it's more of that frustration that I haven't been given the credit that I deserve but again um I, I even said in an interview after Guadalajara, after the Ryder fight, they asked me, and again, this is as a fan or some. I would say take some time off, not officially retire, but take a little break, rest the body. You know, you got so much other going on outside of boxing. In the meantime, let, you know, at the time there was the Charlo, there was Benavides, there's Muguia. Let everybody face each other, put some miles on them. Because they haven't been in wars yet, like real, real war. They haven't had a long career. They're still young. You come back a little while later, and now you fight the guy at the top. And guess what? The money just doubled. And people that, ah, he won't fight it, now are dying to see you back. Because once they're gone, that's when we, man, everybody misses Floyd now. All of a sudden, people that used to, ah, Floyd is boring. Floyd is this. But Floyd had huge events. So it's like, you know, it, it again, it, it goes back to the, you know, enjoy what you have when you have it because once it's gone, you're going to be glamoring for it. And I think that's that's the story ending. You come back, you know, Sugar Ray did it. Floyd did it. Manny did it. You know, they all took off for a little while and then they come back and it's even a bigger fight because, oh, he's coming back for one more. Everybody flocks to see you. But when you're there constantly, oh, I know I could see him. If I don't see him in May, I'll see him in September. If I don't see him in September, I'll see him in May. It's sort of, uh, but again, you know, sometimes they don't want to retire and they want to continue. Um, in your opinion, how valuable and necessary is that Floyd Mayweather, um, I guess, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, backing, you know, uh, giving the world that, Notice that that you're next, uh, like he's done with Tank, because we see Shakur, we see Devin, they're fighting the competition we're asking for. They want to, you know, openly fight those guys. Tank, he doesn't ask for those fights, but somehow he's the biggest and he's the attraction. Um, what's your thoughts on Mayweather Promotions and, and what they've been able to do with Tank and can they continue to replicate that? Because it looks like they're about to make another tank with Carmel Moten. So what is it? What is it that these other promoters don't like? We give Top Rank. I, I hate that this question is so long-winded, but just to give you backstory, we give Top Rank all the credit for their great matchmaking and how they can build the fighter, but they never make a fucking pay-per-view star. Like it, all the pay-per-view stars seem to be with PBC. What is going on? Well, I agree with you a hundred percent. The matchmaking at Top Rank is unmatched. They're the top matchmakers. Bruce and Brad are amazing. But all the pay-per-view stars came from top rank. You know, uh, Floyd, Oscar, and, and, you know, goes back. Chavez, you know, a, a lot of them came from there. Today, it has, it has died out because I think we have too many pay-per-views. Back in the day when it was pay-per-view, it was the Super Bowl. It was something big. It was a star already. You know, Oscar, Floyd. Then everything started going pay-per-view. And it got, fans started getting like, man, another pay-per-view, another pay-per-view, another pay-per-view. Tank is definitely a very exciting, very fun fighter. But what makes it, I, I, I won't say it's not Floyd and Leonard. They've done a tremendous job. But Tank has a lot to with it because he he can box, but we haven't seen it. He goes out there and looks for knockouts. He's exciting. He's fun. But he can box. He has an IQ that we don't give him credit because we think, oh, he's a knockout guy. He's exciting. He's fun. 
But look what he did with Ryan. He pulled Ryan. And Ryan shouldn't have fallen into getting pulled because I have the height. I have the reach. I need you to come to me to try to get on the inside so I can catch you coming in. But Ryan gets pulled and Lord makes a miss, makes a miss, makes a miss, times him. Boom. Whether he knew of the injury or not, he still timed him, pulled him, pulled him, pulled him. By making go a little step back, little step back. Now all of a sudden I think, okay, I'll be, he's backing up for me. No, he's pulling you. Don't go, don't fall for it. And then boom, the shot. So Javante is very smart. You see it in sparring sessions. You see him control pace. You see him. But yeah, having a Floyd behind you definitely helps. Having an Oscar behind you definitely helps because they've done it. They've, you know, they've they've gone through it. But that's where the promotion comes in. You know, as great as a promoter, Eddie Hearn, as great as a promoter, Bob Arum, the greatest, they never stepped into the ring. So that, that for say, Bernard and Floyd and, and, and Oscar talks, when they sit down and talk to their fighter and, and give them that advice, there is a better communication there. Now, the other guys can talk about, you know, other things, not just the ring, but what does a young fighter want to do and listen to somebody who did it, somebody they looked up to? Yeah, not to go down that rabbit hole, but it just seems like Ryan doesn't um, look at Oscar as a mentor or Bernard. You know, there's been a lot of friction uh, reported through that relationship, you know, um, renegotiating contracts on social media. He's had numerous issues with Bernard and, and, and Oscar thus far. Um, do you see Carmel Moten becoming uh, as big as Tank is? He just had an, a fantastic eight-rounder um, on the last pay-per-view with Tim Zhu and Fondora. Did you, were you able to catch that? I didn't see that one. I saw his debut. I think it was on the Spence Crawford. Very impressive for such a young kid. Uh, I can see him being a future, obviously a champion, obviously a champion, a star. I would just say, go slow. There's no, there's no rush. Do it, you know, go slow. <laughs> well, they, I wish you would have watched the last fight because they fought a Leo Santa Cruz It was a fighter. tough fight. Yeah, it was. it was a tough fight. I saw him. The kid came to win. But that's where the the... the the training wheels sh still shouldn't come off, and it's great. And it's hard sometimes for when the fighters have been so great, like a Mayweather, like an Oscar, like, you know, Bernard, because they fought everybody. So it's like, if I could do it, you can do it. But let's not forget, they were matched early as well. A build there until it counts. Like, what I mean by that is, yeah, Fulton won. But Fulton can't have these type of fights, fight after fight after fight, because you can cut a career short. Too much wear and tear, too much. By the time you get there, it's almost like it's time to retire. So the tough fights need to be when I get to that level. Right now, hey, keep building, keep building, keep building. Not knockouts in the first round either, because you're not going to progress. You're not going to grow. You're not going to get that experience. You need the rounds right now. But... They can't be every tough fight. So if you have a tough fight right now, I'd go back to getting something. Okay, let's get something short. And then another short. Let's put them in the southpaw. Let's put them with different styles. Okay, now we got to get a little test here. And then after the little test, okay, let's go back to it. So it can't be test after test after test because he's still a baby. He's still a baby, still growing, and there's a high potential. High potential. Is Virgil Ortiz... Still a baby in your eyes. Because I swear to God, you guys have, and I know you're not with them anymore, but you, I'm sure, have matched 80% uh, of his fight. What is going on? Like, I mean, he's got three divisions now. No world title. No top five opponent. What is it that you guys know that we don't know? What the hell is going on? It's very unfortunate. It, it It is something that's like, wow. You know, some fighters, and no knock. I'm not going to say his name. Some fighters are two-division world champions that, 
that shouldn't have been fighting for a world title. And he's an ex-champion now. But uh, how he won world titles, props to him. You know, great. Virgil, it's very unfortunate. Virgil should be a two-division world champion going on his third division. By the time he was getting close to that first division at 140, his body just outgrew it. And it was just like, we got to jump to 47. We were close. Then comes 47. And obviously, we know that, you know, he was in line to fight for the world title against Stanionis. And, you know, that fight just wasn't meant to be. Four times it got canceled. Stanionis had the appendicitis. And then Virgil got sick two or three times. And I think at 54, God willing, I mean, Virgil is one of the kids that works. Nobody works harder than him. Dedicated. Doesn't have all the outside distractions. So he, if, if, it, if it was in terms of who deserves it more, Virgil should be a four or five time world champion by now. Because he works hard. He's dedicated. He's disciplined. Super talented. He was a kid that I kept saying, like, you check every fight and, and slow it down and then speed it up. And he fought a former world champion, I think, in his 10th fight. Juan Carlos Salgado knocks him out. Mauricio Herrera knocks him out. I mean, he's done perfect. I've done every single fight of Virgil except the up to the last one um, this year in Vegas. And even Frederick the, the, Lawson, the, right? With Lawson. Um, Which is crazy because somehow Lawson is coming right back to yeah. Golden Boy. Yeah. After yeah. the referee claiming that he had an aneurysm. I don't understand what's going on, in the, you know, but. Uh, yeah, that scary when I saw it and it was like okay what well, obviously he put on a good fight with with Rocha um but with Virgil it's I know he's gonna be a world champion we have not even seen how good he is he's not a baby he's a man ready to win the world title and I think uh this year he will be a world champion as a fan the fight to make him against Charlo or him against Spence, both Texans, you know, one, I don't know if he still holds any belts or they stripped them all, but you know, that's a fight that is beautiful for Texas. And, and regardless of what people say, he went the f distance with Canelo. I don't see him going the distance with, with Virgil and then Spence in Dallas against Virgil, Whew. you know, obviously Spence, get a couple fights in, get some wins to show that, hey, the Crawford fights in the past, get some confidence back in this, but that's a fight as a fan that I would love to see. And I have to favor Virgil in both of them. Virgil is, he is the guy. He is the guy. It's very unfortunate that he doesn't walk into the 54 division, at least with one title. But again, God's timing for whatever reason, it wasn't his time. But this is a kid that, again, works his ass off, is disciplined, and is so talented. We all see one side of Virgil, the guy that comes out and knocks you out. He's a big puncher. We haven't seen the other side because, again, similar to Canelo, nobody's brought it out yet. When you guys see it, when the world sees it, they're going to be like, wow, we didn't know he had this. You know, the boxing. Kick a box. What, what's your thoughts on this uh, Haney-Garcia undercard? I think that, um, yeah, it's not good. <laughs> While they have a few A-side names, it's just that. A-sides, you know, uh, in showcase fights. Um, Barboza's fighting an unknown Ireland guy. You know, they're getting uh, Conwell out and busy after almost two years off, but they're... I don't see anything helping this pay-per-view. Uh, do you think this is going to be a success? Because a lot is riding on it. Obviously, if it doesn't do well, the winner can't get a tank fight. Here, here, here's the thing that a lot of the times in the negotiating, you know, the guarantees, the upside, the the main event takes so much of that money and that budget that you have no more money for an undercard. And today, because of where the prices have gone, the purses have gone, nobody will take a risk and nobody will fight. It's very hard. It's very hard to put a very, you know, the days of, and I went to those Chavez 
And on the undercard, Frankie Randall and Jesse James Leja and, and, and Finito Lopez. And wow, you know, you had, I, I remember Chavez fighting Trinidad against Yodi Boy was on the undercard. Jesse James Leja fought uh, Gabriel Ruelas on the undercard. Koji fought Frankie Randall on the undercard. I mean, you had five or six fights that could have been a main event. And it was just in the strategy again. I mean, when I showed up to the arena, Finito Lopez had already defended his title. I'm like, what are you talking about? I miss Finito. We lost that because now 90% of that goes to the main event. So now you have no room for a but you know, for now you do these main events where, okay, you're gonna get a guarantee of this. And and guess what? The winner will get an extra of this, but let's get out of the the upside and i know the fighters are going to help me and i'm a helping fighter now i'm managing fighters hey if i'm going to go in and sit i'm going to try to get upside but in general for the good of boxing is i want to see a great appetizer then i want to see a great main course then i want to see a great dessert that's when i sit down and eat i want to i want a little bit of everything not just a great dessert at the end you know so so how so I think you guys I hate to cut it, but how were you guys able to do Lucas Matias and Danny on the undercard of Canelo and Floyd? Like, that main event had to be one of the highest, uh, most expensive. So how could Danny get on there versus Lucas? The purses, even at that time, were high, but not as high as they got. They, they started going higher and higher and higher. And when they started getting competitive of we pay more than they do, come over here, come over there, and it started – Get into stuff. I mean, there was fighters getting paid a million dollars for a sparring session. Where before it was, yeah, you're going to get paid a million dollars, but you're going to fight, hey, Danny, you're going to fight Lucas. And Lucas, you're going to fight Danny. And that was, yeah, that was a hell of a card. That was a hell of a card. I mean, but but at the same time, Mayweather and Canelo understood and more in that moment, more Mayweather of saying, I'm willing to sacrifice off my money because I'm the guy here that has to take the biggest share to make a solid, solid undercard. Mayweather was a smart businessman and obviously had the smartest behind him. And now today, a lot of the young fighters are not thinking like, I, I, I want more. Well, I'm more, I deserve more. I deserve more. You know, right now I heard, and again, I'm, I'm on this side. Now I heard that uh, Ryan is getting the bigger share than Haney and Haney has the titles. And I'm glad Haney understood that. And his dad that, okay, you know what? Okay, even though I'm the champion, but a lot of times they don't think that way. I'm the champion, I deserve no more. No, you know what? Regardless, Ryan's not a champion. Ryan does bring in more of the views, and that's just going to generate you more money. I told Chavez Jr. when he was going to fight Canelo. He was stuck on the 50-50, and it had to be 50-50, and it wasn't fair. And, and I told him, you could get 50-50 with Golovkin, but you're going to do the main selling. The people are going to come see you. 64, whatever they ended up with Canelo is going to drive more money than 50. So people have to look at and stop thinking about fit. The percentage is more ego because it's, I'm giving up more. If it, I rather have 70, 30 of 1 million than 50, 50 of 10,000. I mean, that it, it, forget the percentages. What does it mean here at the end of the day? And that's where they have it. Percentage is eagle. If I'm hearing you, because at the end of the day, what is a percentage? How much is it going to make? That's what they have to understand. How many dollars? Absolutely, man. Um, let me get to some of these questions from the people before we run out of time. We got James Valdez, San Antonio. What's one of your fondest memories working with Golden Boy Promotions? Because he's from San Antonio. Uh, Omar Figueroa against um, uh, Nishoka. No, it wasn't Nishoka. Arakawa. Arakawa in San Antonio fighting for the world title. And this was special for me because when I signed Omar Figueroa, there was a lot of emails that went to Golden Boy saying, who signs your talent? Because whoever signed Omar Figueroa should get fired. And I, I, I was like hurt. I was like, whoa, whoa, why? And there wasn't one email. It was two or three, four emails, four calls. Because... But the wait, call, but wait, the, I'm sorry, I got to interrupt because I received that story as Oscar signing him and going all the way to Omar Figueroa's 
high school and, and with let's go Texas and making this big deal for this teenage kid. Did that not work out that way? No. So I, I get a video from the father. I had seen Omar fight in Texas in one of our small shows. I met the father. In fact, Omar didn't fight. His father was there with another fighter. And he comes up to me and brings me video. Now, I used to get DVDs left and right everywhere. They'd mail them. I'd watch them on my trips to other fights, on the plane, in the hotel room. And I'd get guys shadow boxing, jumping rope, the next Tyson, the next this, the next Floyd, and far from it, right? Every once in a while, somebody would be really good. But what stood out about this kid was, number one, just before social media, they did a whole production. It was a, like a movie that I was watching. Very well done video. Knocking guys out. He had like five or six fights. So I went in and I said, hey, I want you guys to watch this video. Take a look at him. Wow, this is, he looks hot. He's knocking guys out regardless of who they were. But I saw a connection also with fans. And old ladies, young girls, middle-aged people, everybody really liked him. And he was very personable, spoke very well, very polite. So I set up a meeting. We talk. We get on the phone. We, we sign him. Um, and, and when we announced it, it was a lot of like, who does your signing? You know, this guy's not even a, not a national, not even at a state level. He had a ex amateur career. I think he did beat Spence, but it wasn't an outstanding amateur. I think Omar had like 50 fights, maybe 30 wins, 20 losses. So when we get to San Antonio and he's fighting for the world title against Arakawa from Japan, he breaks both his hands and wins the world title. That was very special because we shut up a lot of people. He made me proud. It was very exciting fight. I mean, Omar was always in fun fights, exciting fights. And uh, people started changing their mind about Omar. They were like, man, this kid's real. He's good. Hey, bring him here. Bring him there. So that made me very proud. And, and to see the father and son at the time uh, fulfill that dream was cool. I want to take you back to Jojo Diaz. Um, you said you were responsible for signing him. What sort of relationship did you have? And And... It obviously had to be a good bond with him or someone close to him because he's the only fighter from the 12, 2012 outside of Clarissa Shields Olympians not to sign Al, which was always baffling to me. I was very close with JoJo. I met him right before the Olympics. Um, he hadn't gone to the Olympics. Yeah, I, I met him. So Jorge Linares is training with Freddie Roach. And Freddie takes him to Colorado Springs because he's working with some of the amateurs for the Olympics or Olympians. And Jorge calls me one day. Hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it going in Colorado? I'm talking to him and how's it going? I said, hey, do me a favor. Keep a close eye on Jose Ramirez. That's who I wanted to sign. I wanted to sign Jose Ramirez. And he says, oh, I sparred him. Jorge tells me. I sparred him. I said, what do you think? Oh, he's good. He's good. But Robert, he says, man, look into this kid named Diaz. He didn't say Jojo. He didn't. He said, look into this little southpaw Diaz from California. I didn't know Jojo at the time. I didn't know him. I didn't know of him either. And I said, really? He goes, Roberto, one of the best kids I've ever seen. And I said, wow, okay. Let me look into it. So I make some calls and right away, oh, yeah, from South of Monte, Jojo Diaz. So now Golden Boy has a show. Downtown L.A., it wasn't Belasco. It was another theater we had shows at. And in walks the manager at the time who had a Golden Boy fighter with us who I had signed, Sharif Bogari. So he walks in. I said, what's up? How you doing? And he introduces me to this kid who looked 14 years old. And he says, oh, this is uh, Jojo Diaz or Joseph Diaz. And I said, the Olympian? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, man, Linares has talked so high about you. And I like what I saw as far as presence, attitude, persona. And I said, hey, good luck, man. I'll be supporting. I'll be watching. We watched, came back, and I talked to the manager, and I said, I want to sign Joseph Diaz, man. And a lot had to do with Jorge Linares. That's, uh, that's uh, pretty dope, man. Shout out to Linares because, again, yeah, yeah. that was like the one that got away. We got James Benitez in Atlanta that says, uh, was Deontay Wilder and Charlo easy to match make for you? Because I wonder what really caused the breakup then and matchroom. 
I'm not. I'm lost here. Was the they, they went? They went to PBC, both of them. Um, and it's a great question with Deontay. I matched uh, along with Jay Dees, his his uh, manager at the time and trainer, a lot of his fights. And there was a lot of criticism. He's not fighting nobody. He's fighting Kent. One thing I'll say with Deontay was his right hand was for real. He touched you with the right hand, you're going to sleep. But early on in his career at Fantasy Springs, he fought a journeyman called Harold Sconiers. And Harold dropped him really, really hard. And I remember thinking, wow, it's over. It's over. And Deontay got up, shaky legs, uh, got, got it back. A couple rounds later, knocked out Harold Sconiers. But that told me, if you can stay away from punchers, stay away from punchers until it's that time. And when does that time? When he's fighting for the world title. At that point, I got you here. You're there. I can't fight for you. So when, I remember when Deontay fought for the world title against the Vern in Vegas, the WBC after the fight, I'm having dinner. They call me and say, hey, we got his belt. How do we, how do we get a hold of him? I said, let's take it up to his room. Took it up to his room. I said it then. I'll say it now. It was bittersweet. Because his contract, that was his last fight with Golden Boy. But I was so proud of Deontay. Uh, I took him to belt. I said, congratulations. We shut up a lot of people. We brought the title back to America. Because he was the first American to win the heavyweight title back. I said, go make it proud. I'll be supporting you from here on out. So the matchmaking was hard. Because in the heavyweights, how do you uh, you stay away from a big puncher? Shit, every punch can be a big punch right there in an ending punch. So... It was strategic and, and tough and here and there. It wasn't tough on them turning down fights. In fact, I just knew, okay, what well, with Charlo, you know, I saw Charlo in Vegas at the Canelo fight before the Canelo fight. And this made me so proud. Golden Boy started getting a rep of outside people say, well, if you sign with Golden Boy, be, be ready, man. They're going to match you tough. They match tough. They match tough. When I first started, I said, I'm not here to build a record. I'm here to build a champion. And I stuck to it. And I loved when that reputation started getting out, that golden boy matches you tough. So when I saw Charlo and his family one day walking out of, on the hall uh, of their floor, and I'm walking into my room, he hugs me, gives me some love, this and that, and then tells the family, oh, this is Robert Diaz. He, he was my matchmaker. He matched me really tough, man. Rob, why'd you do that to me? Why'd you match me so tough all these years? And I said, you know what? And this was right away. I didn't I didn't know he was going to throw that at me, but it was like, because that's what got you here. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been here. If you would have been much soft, you would have been here to fight Canelo. So now you owe me one. So now go do your thing and, and, and do your best. So I was proud of that. Uh, I always be proud of that. Yeah, I matched them tough. But when they fought for titles, if they didn't win them, they made sure that they remembered him. The champion would remember him. So I really, really am proud of that. And it was easy because Oscar being a fighter, and that's what I mentioned about Floyd too, is uh, they weren't, you know, they fought everybody. So they weren't one of those that, hey, don't put them in too tough. Don't put them in too tough. You know, they let you work. And that, I think, is a key to success in making good fights. Absolutely. Uh, keeping it moving here. We have just a few more, and we're almost done. We got um, no Luna Glider. Thanks you. Thank you for coming on. Uh, and for your time, Roberto. What's your favorite fight you helped put together? I mean, there were so many fights. There were so many that that you know always stick to memory. Uh, um, one of one of my favorites is. And it's a fight that probably doesn't get a lot of recognition, but Jesus Soto Caras against Yoshihiro Kamagai. Um, we didn't have a network anymore. It was tough. The budget was small. We come out with this small network uh, that had never done sports. It was only a novela, Estrella TV. It's at the Belasco, probably sits about 800 people. So I don't have a big budget. Jesus Soto Caras had fought some of the biggest names already. And, and I go to him and I said, hey, you you're going to fight your show. He don't. Now, I had tried to make that fight four times before it actually happened. So part of me said, you know what? It's not meant to be. Stop pushing for it. But the other part as a fan say, man, this is a can't miss. This is a can't miss. So I make it with little money. It's a war. I mean, a war. And it, at the end of the night, I'm like, man, nobody deserves to win. I hope 
the judges get it right or nobody deserves to lose. I'm sorry. I hope the judges don't mess it up and, and go one way or the other because whoever, nobody deserves to lose. And they got it right. A draw. Luckily for that, HBO picked up the rematch. Both fighters got paid a little more. And at that point, yeah, Yoshihiro outworked them, beat them, stopped them. But Jesus Soto Carazo was one of my favorites to work with as a person. Really humble, really good guy, funny guy. And fought everybody, man. The guy was a warrior. And another one, and I'll be quick on that one, is I love Miguel Cotto. As a fan, I was always a big fan of Miguel Cotto. I got real close to Miguel Cotto. He called me one day and said, if I get my release from Rock Nation, will you sign me? I said, are you crazy? Of course I'd sign you. Um, it was a, during a time when Puerto Rico had no world champions. And Puerto Rico, as we know, has had world champions, some of the greatest fighters ever. So I was very proud because once we signed Miguel Cotto, his very next fight, he fights Yoshihiro Kamagai, wins the world title. And within a six-month period, together, we crowned like four world champions for Puerto Rico. And it was Tito Acosta, Machado, Miguel Cotto, and Jesus Rojas. All within a six-month period after not having a world champion. So me being Mexican, you think I'd be champ? No, no. It was just a coincidence. It happened. They landed in the right fights. But in a short period of time, Puerto Rico had four world champions. And me being a little part of it, because they were all tied with Cotto Promotions or when I had signed Jesus Rojas separately, it was like, wow, we brought four world champions to Puerto Rico. So that's one of one of the proudest moments as well. Um, I got Saint Knows Best. Would a well put together tournament for specific weight classes work in today's boxing climate? If not, why not? If so, what would you make sure the tournament has in place for it to be successful? I think tournaments are always fun. Um, the problem with tournaments is because it's a contact sport, you know, baseball, football, basketball, they can do these tournaments and the star player gets injured or one of the players gets injured. There's always replacements. That's the hard part with the tournaments in boxing. If that individual during training gets cut, gets injured, gets sick, doesn't make weight, it postpones and it prolongs and prolongs and prolongs. So you might not get the final in that period of time. Now, you could always have backups, substitutes, be ready, but then it's not the same thing anymore. It's like saying, well, if, 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 you know, the Bulls, if Jordan got injured, okay, take out the Bulls and bring in this other team, then it's not the same thing anymore. So that's what hurts it. But what I would do, similar to a tournament, is, and I did it for a while while at Golden Boy with the Facebook, when we got the Facebook dates and fights, is I love doing countries because there, if fighter A gets injured, okay, replace him with another fighter from Puerto Rico, replace him with another fighter from Mexico, replace him from Venezuela. But it's still Mexico is going to fight Venezuela tonight and Puerto Rico is going to fight Philippines tonight. The tournament goes on without postponements. And people tune in to watch their country. It's, it's almost like an Olympic. It, it, they're going to turn in to watch their country, not so much that fighter. Because whoever it is, I'm going to support Mexico. I'm going to support Puerto Rico. I'm going to support Venezuela. We did it several times in uh, on our Facebook shows, and they were really cool. It was really fun bringing out all the fighters before they fought, doing the national anthems for both countries, the flags there. They're in as teammates. You know, you already have one fighter gloved and his opponent gloved. Then the rest of the team goes back into the locker rooms to start getting ready, and then the fight starts. And we did it with Mexico against Venezuela. We did it with um, Mexico, I think, Puerto Rico. We did a, a few on Facebook, and, and they were fun. They were good to watch. You know, William Cepeda did a couple there. Oscar Duarte did there. Diego de la Hoya did there. Uh, so it, it was good, and that way it doesn't postpone due to injuries or, or fallouts. Um, since you're bringing up Cepeda, I got Ernest the, Ernesto, excuse me, uh, Zarate that says, how does you, Roberto, see the Shakur versus William Cepeda fight going? Cepeda can compete with anybody because of his output, because of his out, his work rate. Um, personally, I'm a big fan of Cepeda. I know Shakur's talent is tremendous. 
I like that fight, but if it's a unification, if it's bigger than what it is now, opponent versus champion, I think Cepeda can go on and win a world title. Um, personally, if I'm if I was still there while managing or matchmaking, I wait for Lomachenko to fight uh, Kambosis. If Kambosis gets Lomachenko on a little bit now on the slide and wins, perfect fight for William. If Lomachenko wins because he's still that much better than George, than George, then perfect fight for William. Um, I think William, and I'm biased here, but I think William could beat either or. And now I go into a Shakur Stevenson fight as champion versus champion. Now the stakes are higher. Now the stakes are even. Now it's 50-50 or close to it. Even if, again, forget that I said the 50-50 because there goes what, from what I said earlier. But now it's more of a, let's sit at the table evenly. Right now, here's here's what it is, man. Take it or leave it. I'm the champion. You're the challenger. And if we want to go to purse bid, the splits don't benefit the challenger. So um, I'd like it to be more of a unification, more significant, a little bit built more. And uh, I think it's a hell of a fight. And I have to favor William because of his output. What direction do you think they go? Obviously, his last fight with um, Maxi Hughes was an eliminator. The one and two is vacant. Mm -hmm. um, he's highly ranked in the WBC at number one and in the WBA at number one. Do you think they wait for the tank fight? Because I'm hearing that he's fighting Southpaw Giovanni St um, Cabrera. Yeah. Potentially could be next, which would be his third Southpaw in a row. So he's mm -hmm. preparing for Shakur. Loma or Tank? I think the third southpaw in a row is a coincidence. I don't think it's really too much. Uh, like when he fought Mercito, Mercito had beat Jojo. He's a notable name. Uh, it's it's a good opponent, a good fight. Mexico against the Philippines. Um, Maxi Hughes, you know, gave Cambosos a hell of a fight. Many people saw him win. Perfect opponent, not a big puncher. I think that's just a coincidence. I don't think it has anything to do with, oh, well, Gervonta or, or Shakur getting ready for that. Um, I think the Loma the Loma or the Kambosos winner would be ideal because, look, if you lose to Lomachenko, there's no shame in that, man. He's one of the best fighters to ever step in the ring. However, Loma's age, he's not a lightweight. He's very small for a lightweight. He struggled with lightweights. Given versus... Uh, Williams' youth, 100 punches around, his conditioning, that's the fight that Loma can lose because you at this age, you can't throw more than 100 punches around. You can't throw 60 punches around, so you're going to get outworked. And he's not a puncher that, okay, he can knock out uh, William, which anything could happen, but it, you're not supposed to knock him out. Now, if it's Combosis, Combosis likes to throw down. And he likes he gets hit. He's open. That also fits well into William. So I like either of those two, whoever wins that fight. Because even again, if you lose to a Lomachenko at this particular point versus losing to a Shakur or losing to a Gervonta, and Gervonta is right there, but uh, I'd rather go into those fights as a champion. And now there's more at stake. Absolutely. Uh I'm just smiling here because I told my audience so long ago that that's the route. You go, Loma's older. And if George gets lucky, he got lucky. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, but, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, we got two more and you're done. Stefan in Toronto says, do you feel Oscar's business, Golden Boy Promotions, is going downhill without you? No, not at all. Not at all. Um, I say that because, look, it's, it's an adjustment for both sides. After many years together of somebody doing one thing, uh, it's, it's, it's everybody's replaceable. Everybody, uh, the job goes on, the shows go on, but I don't see them going downhill. I see it's just an uh, a moment of adaptarse, you know, to adapt and, and pick it up and going. But look, they're making some of the best fights right now with Ryan against Haney. Munguia against Canelo, uh, Surdo winning the world title, props out to Surdo, but making very, history again. They're very non-existent in those promotions. Golden Boy, we're not I, like I wish Matchroom was lead promoter for for Haney and 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 Ryan. It would be more felt 
we would feel the 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 the, the promotional push. Uh, same thing for Canelo. I, I don't see anything that they're doing for Canelo. And according to the reports, he was not even included in those negotiations. He came out and, you know, flipped them off and said a few things. He is making some signings. He brought on Conwell. He brought on O'Hara Davies. It didn't pan out. He, is, he signed Barboza. There's rumors of maybe a Shakur. But, but what could he do with these guys? Like, we got Conwell. Again, you're the matchmaker. Are we signing Conwell to just keep him away from Virgil? Because Conwell's the silver champion at 54. Now you got both of these guys at 54, highly ranked at the WBC, but you just made it clear that that's an opportunity for two paydays with two champions versus losing one of those paydays by putting them both in the same ring together. So, yeah, I don't know. It's a long-winded question. <laughs> No, 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 no. I got it. I got it. And and you know it. Again, um, sometimes it's signings for a particular reason because oh he's perfect for this match and this and that. But I think with Conwell is yeah, eventually a unification. If he can win the world title and Virgil wins a world title, now it's a unification. Now you put them in together because now it means something and it's bigger. Um, to put them in right now against Virgil, I wouldn't see it because uh, Virgil wins by knockout. People are going to say who was Kamala because they need to activate him. They need to get him back into that where the people see how good he is and and really he's the real deal. So it, it's not something right now. It's something maybe down the road. Um, but again, I don't know what how you know what their mindset is. Um, but again, all I could say is I wish them luck. And uh, I know that it's always going to be a force as long as they put in 100%. Ryan in Toronto, I would like to throw my name in the hat to be a part of your team if you're ever if you ever start your own company. Um love the interview. Thanks for the info. That's it. Wow, thank you so much. That's an honor. Send me a message. Let's stay in touch. Michelada time on Twitter or Instagram because you never know. You never know. Like I said earlier, if I can own a part of it, then let's grow. He actually has a, a brother that's 8-0 out of uh, Canada by the name of Joshua Frazier. So, um, yeah, maybe you can help them out uh, with sheer sports management, right? Uh, is, is, is Is my girl Rachel, Rachel? Is she still there? No, Rachel uh, left a while ago. Um, Rachel Charles, shout out to Rachel. Um she went to work for another company, and that company uh, dissolved. And uh, I haven't heard from Rachel. I haven't talked to her. I, I know she was working with a fighter who was fighting, I think, a lot in Dubai, um, a young kid coming up and one everything. One of the McKenna's, I, right? Well, with the McKenna's at one point. But no, this was another fighter, I think, uh, from from Saudi Arabia or something like that. Um, but I haven't talked to her. I haven't seen her, actually. I don't know if she's still in L.A. Okay. And um, so my last one personally and one last one from the people, Bones 13, well, let's start with mine so I don't forget because, uh, you know, I do that a lot often. Um, <laughs> Fernando Beltran, what can you tell me about him? I just think that this guy is phenomenal. I've, uh, you know, he may not be a television promoter where he has a television contract, but this guy finds the best underdogs. All his fighters are underdogs. He turns underdogs in the champions, he has Espinosa, Rafael Espinosa. He has Munguilla. I mean, uh, he has El Navarrete. His fighters are underdog champions. How does this guy find this talent? And and why doesn't is he not interested in his own television deal or or a better relationship? Because he has the talent. Evidently, he's got to keep feeding his talent to co-promoters, right? He's got to co-promote with Golden Boy, co-promote with Top Rank. And he's the one with the true Mexican talent that television wants. Well, he does have a TV. He does have a TV. TV Azteca in Mexico, he has it. Um, you know, with TV, you have dates. With dates, you can sign tons of fighters. And Fernando uh, has been in boxing so many years, obviously with Eric Morales and, and you know, like you mentioned so many. I was at Castillo, the... Castillo, right? Didn't he have Castillo? Castillo... I remember uh, I was at the uh, Espinosa Rovesi fight. Man, I was ready to. I, I I got there really to watch Xander, you know, and and I see Xander, 
congratulate. And I'm ready to leave before the main event. But Fernando had told me, I had saw him, said hello. And he told me, man, watch my kid today. He's going to win. He was very confident and excited. So that, all right, let me sit back and watch. And w I'm so happy I stayed, man, because that was one hell of a fight. Should have been fight of the year. Um, props to Espinosa. Props to Rovesi. It was a great fight back and forth. You know, when I saw Espinosa come out of the ring and barely could walk and realized that he had hurt his ankle when he went down and yet kept fighting. But yes, props have to be given to him. And I told him at the press conference for Canelo and Munguia, I said, I congratulate you. You brought up Munguia so good and got him matured. You know, sometimes it's hard because the fans press and press and press and press. But he brought Munguia slowly, slowly, slowly. There was times where I was frustrated, man. Fans would be like, when are Munguia going to step up? When is Munguia going to step up? The matchmaker, Golden Boy, uh, they're protecting him too much. And it was tough to swallow. But look where they are today. Now, do you put him in too early yesterday and he doesn't get here? Or do you groom it this way and now where he's at? And if he pulls it off on May 4th, wow. I mean, how big is that? You know, and if he doesn't, you lost to arguably one of the best in boxing, you know, pound for pound, either one, two, or three, however you have it. Um, so there's no shame, but guess what? You got paid. So, and, and Munguia is not going to go in there for payday. I could tell you that. Munguia is not going to go in there. Yeah, the payday is great, but he's not going in there for the payday. He's not happy just for that. He's going to go in there to try to win. I, and I've heard a couple of interviews already. When I win, when I win. And, th and the way he looks physically right now, his body, I mean, he's coming to it. He's coming for it. So, uh, yes, Beltran has a lot of the fighters. But but that's that was like from day one. I mean, he builds like an Eric Morales in Tijuana. They signed to the big promoter in America. They take you to the big, you know, HBO contract. That was Eric Morales. And then once they see the big promoter, hey man, this 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 is for real, you know. And and the dealings with the TV and and getting Televisa and getting it on, you know, the big pay per views here into Mexico and getting them to pay, that's what opens door for the other kids to come in, no matter who they are. And some of them do come in as opponents, but wow, when they come in ready, Espinosa, really nobody knew, you know. Yeah, he's undefeated, but who has he Bro, fought? I gotta tell everybody about this. I had a caller. Called me for over a month. Over a month consistently. Bet on Espinosa. I'm doing my research. I'm doing my research. So he's called so much. I'm like, all right, let me see what this kid's got. I go to Box Rec, and it's like all Mexico fights. Yeah. What you yeah. can find are unknown dudes. Yeah. This guy put, I think it was 4000 or 8000 down on Espinosa and won $67,000. Wow, 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 wow. But Crazy. see, that's a lot of the times that's heart because maybe you know the kid, you've seen the kid. Oh, this guy is good, good, good. But and I, I'm not, I don't know the caller, but it, sometimes, yeah, that's heart. You're going with your heart and that's wishful thinking. But most of the time, it doesn't work because you fought a bunch of guys. You're supposed to be to Mexico. You got a pretty record, but now you're coming in here to the U.S. for the first time. You're the opponent. And you're fighting a Cuban two-time champion and, and somebody decorated with so many amateurs. But in boxing, logic doesn't work. So if it would have been baseball, would have been basketball, would have been football, there's no way Espinosa wins. But it's boxing, and that doesn't when it's heart and determination, it takes over the logic. Um, so Bro Matias is saying that the best fight for him would be Pitbull Cruz. Um, how important is it for boxing to have that rivalry? We, I feel like, uh, you know, I haven't seen Puerto Rico versus Mexico since Orlando Salido and Juanma on that level, on the big stage in Puerto Rico. Um, could Pitbull Cruz and, and Sabril Matias be that? And should they focus on each other versus other fighters just to give boxing that rivalry that it hasn't had? I think it's a beautiful rivalry. There's a, there's always going to be, uh, you know, Puerto Rico, again, histor historically, some of the best fighters in boxing, as small as the 
island is compared to Mexico. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, they're very close. If not, Puerto Rico's winning by like one or two fights. So that's incredible in itself. Um, it's a great fight. They both come forward. They both throw nonstop punches. Uh, it's a can't miss. But I don't think it's necessary right now. Um, as a fan, I'd love to see Matias against Teofimo. And then maybe Pitbull against somebody. And then it's it's almost like a, a – that's the tough one because if it's or whoever – Pitbull against the winner of Ryan and Haney and Matias against Teofimo, and then the winners fight each other, something like that. That would be exciting because now if it does get to Puerto Rico and Mexico at the end, oof, now it's bigger. And if it doesn't, Hey, maybe you start a new rivalry because that's the beauty of boxing that could always be, you know, it, it was originally Mexico and Puerto Rico. Then it became Mexico against the Philippines with Marquez and Pacquiao. Then, But it could always change. Then it was for a while, uh, uh, you know, Triple G, Kazakhstan, and then Uzbekistan, you know, so it's like you could always change it up. Last one, I believe, here is uh, from Bones13, and he says, do you still talk to Oscar? How was your relationship with him now and after you left Golden Boy? Thank you. Uh, go Niners. Hey, go Niners. It broke my heart again with those Chiefs. <laughs> Man, I was at the Super Bowl. I was so confident we were going to win this time around. I was at in Miami at the Super Bowl. Uh, but this time I was very confident. And, again, they broke my heart, those Chiefs. But we'll get them. We'll get them one day. Um, no, I haven't talked to Oscar. Um, you know what? On my part. Nothing but respect, nothing but love, and uh, I wish them well. Um, again, it was 15 great years. I was able to work with some of the greatest athletes that ever stepped into the ring. I still share good moments with a lot of them. Um, send my love to Bernard always. Um, but but uh, right now, I think it's, uh, you know, we, we need, after 15 years, it was great relationship, but I think there needs some, some space and time, and uh, hopefully um, with time it could go back to courteous and respectful. What, I guess, how can you sum it up for the people that just don't understand what happened? I mean, it came from one day to the next, and now there's a void. We can see it with this big pay-per-view. They could have used your help with the pay-per-view with, with Haney and, 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 and Ryan, the matchmaking. I know you don't want to give too much, and you, you, you probably don't want to, but just... Anything to help us understand? Like, why would you not be there? Well, I thank you for those words because obviously that means a lot to me that the people that you, you know, uh, think of me in that high regard and 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 really I, I hear it from fans on, on social media and everything, the matching and everything like that. That that really honors me because I'm proud. I was always proud uh, of the matches. It, I always would give it a lot of thought. Um, but like Tupac said, changes changes mm. and changes are good man um you know like every movie like every book there's a beginning there's a middle and there's an end um again i enjoyed my time there it was a dream come true uh sometimes i'd wake up and say wow i can't believe you know where i'm at but that gave me a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge, a lot of open doors. There's been a lot of love and support from the organizations, Gilberto Mendoza, Paquito, Mauricio, um, Daryl. They've all given me a lot of love and support. And now I'm, I'm really enjoying, look, I'm almost, I'm, I'm, I'm 55. Uh, I don't feel like slowing down. I feel 35, but I had a heart attack last year. Whoa. A, ma a massive heart attack. Uh, they call it, they called it the widow maker. So uh, it's actually a year of this month. Later, a couple more weeks, it'll be a year. And that made me give it a lot of thought that, you know, when you're on the job, traveling so much, on the road, uh, missed birthday parties of my kids, missed, I would have missed the wedding. But uh, uh, now I can spend more time with the family. Now I can enjoy I'm traveling. Like I said earlier, you know, I go to fights and it's, it's, it's work, but it's like a vacation at the same time. I tell my wife to come and, I'm enjoying it and, and I'm doing what I love because I'm still working individually with the fighters. So uh, fighters sometimes or the parents or the, the teams don't understand what the promoters have to go through. So now me being that I have been 15 years on the, de on the other side of the desk, now I can say, 
look, let's make a happy medium because it has to work for both. Not just, I want more, I want an easier opponent, and, and I, I need more money. It, it, there's little more to that to make that relationship work. And I think that's where I'm going to help a lot of fighters understand their value, what they deserve, and what they don't deserve. Absolutely, man. Well, we appreciate you for all your time, uh, Roberto. Thank you for coming on, man. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I'm sure, I don't know if you're watching the live, but everybody just continues to repeat. Great interview, amazing interview. So uh, you really helped us here by uh, giving a lot of insight into the boxing world. We'd love to get you back on. Salute for having such a great mic, too. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure. You know how to reach me anytime. It's it's on, honestly uh, can't wait to see you at the next fight. I'll probably see you on May fourth for sure at the Canelo Munguia, and we'll definitely meet up and uh, anytime. And to the fans listening that enjoyed it, that's that's gratitude. I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Roberto Diaz, former matchmaker, now boxing advisor, live on TBV. Phone lines are open if you want to. Uh, join us, maybe talk a little. Oh, Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it dropped off, but I was just giving you the outro uh, and, and letting everybody know that you were on, and we do appreciate your time. Thank you very much. See you soon. Take All right, care. If you want to give out your social media one more time for anybody that wants to get in contact with you. Of course, Michelada time. Uh, I always love the Micheladas. I laid off them a little bit, but I kept it at Michelada time on Instagram and Twitter. And I'm always there. If I don't answer right away, trust me, I will get back to you guys. Take care. Thank you guys for all the support. All right.